There is a handout uh, with a couple of quotations that I shall be using. Uh, first, some preliminaries. The Anglo-Caribbean cultural theorist Stuart Hall coined the term authoritarian populism. Uh, I've lost my page. What's happened here? Yes. Um, to define Thatcherism as the project of undermining the British post-war settlement between labor and capital, essentially by mobilizing a right-wing popular movement aimed at strengthening the state. This seemingly paradoxical fusion of the popular and the authoritarian state would then be turned against the post-war settlement. Stuart Hall realized there is never a pure definition of populism, since any ascription of this or that content to populism is immediately subject to an exception. If the Peronist version of populism in Argentina possesses attribute X, then somehow the Reaganite or Thatcherite version does not possess attribute X, but instead possesses attribute Y, which the Peronist version happens not to possess. Hall sought to obviate this definitional problem by shifting the emphasis from using such general notions as <coughs> ideologies or movements as a unit of analysis preferring instead to emphasize the way ideologies are inextricably bound up with political practices, albeit in always specific and distinctive ways. Hall's approach, which derives from Antonio Gramsci, replaces the notion of fixed ideological meanings and class-ascribed ideologies with the concepts of ideological terrains of struggle, terrains was one of his favorite terms, and the task of ideological transformation. Hall therefore moved away from an abstract general theory of ideology and towards the more concrete analysis of how, in particular historical situations, ideas, and here I quote him, organize human masses and create the terrain on which men, he was writing 30 years ago, move, acquire consciousness of their position, struggle, etc. end of quote. The populist demand is a demand issued by those whose needs cannot be satisfied by the terms of the existing hegemony. As several speakers have alluded to this. As such, the populist demand is the outcome of a political practice which seeks to counter, in certain decisive ways, the hegemony's framing of the populist subject. When Thatcher took office in 1979, the prevailing hege hegemony was the so-called post-war social democratic consensus based on the already mentioned rapprochement between labor and capital. Thatcher's authoritarian populism used a combination of nationalist appeal and the invocation of the myth of a golden past. I put golden past in scare quotes. In the case of Thatcher, Britain's alleged golden past existed in the Victorian age, hence her strident calls for a return to Victorian values. Above all, the Thatcherite political project called for a massive consolidation or reconsolidation of state power. Hall saw Thatcherism as involving a reassertion of the centralized state, despite Thatcher's declaration that she was trying to shake the British people from their dependency on the state. This is not the only distinctive feature of the Thatcherite political project, which also called for a dislodging of the aristocratic or semi-aristocratic base of her own party an echelon that had dominated the Conservative Party for most of its historical existence, and which had also stood at the top of the pyramid of Britain's historic compromise between capital and labor. I'm referring here to the aristocratic and high bourgeois elite in her own party that Mrs. Thatcher referred to contemptuously as the wets. Thatcherite dryness, if one may use such a term, therefore required a purge of this aristocratic echelon from her party's power structure, ensuring, uh, ensuing the ultimate dis, uh, diminution of the role of this elite in the historical compromise. Her goal, obviously, was the wrecking of the post-war compromise between labor and capital, since in her view, this compromise was operating more and more to the disadvantage of capital. So how did this populist project enunciate this demand? The answer must be short. With a barely concealed fervor, Thatcher and Reagan in this country were sensing 
in ways sometimes untidy and surely opportunistic, even as they were always resolute in intent, Reagan with his actor's smile, Thatcher with her teeth-clenching harshness, that they were launched on the business of undoing the economic and political paradigm of, the, of their political predecessors. The waning Keynesian accord that had prevailed since the end of the war was now being supplanted by an emerging neoliberalism, and Hall was its earliest theoretical cartographer. He is, of course, credited with coining the emblematic term Thatcherism even before Thatcher was elected. He was soon recognizing the, uh, recognized as the foremost analyst of the intellectual cultural formation whose labor uh, whose label is now indel indelibly associated with her name. This label designates a populism confine, uh, combined uh, with a then newfangled economic neoliberalism, the crackpot ideas of Milton Friedman, based on the premise that just about any macroeconomic problem could be resolved by tweaking the money supply, uh, were being installed in a position of official primacy where the economy was concerned in the UK and, and uh, the US, and not just in the Pinochet-ruled Chile admired by Friedman. This was coupled with an atavistic social authoritarianism evidenced by her braying refrain, we need a return to Victorian values. Her finance minister uh, defined Thatcherism uh, uh, succinctly in the uh, quotation that you have in the handout. Before a thing is said about Hall's analysis of Thatcherism, it has to be noted that in addition to dealing with Thatcherism and its legacies, Hall's richly varied purview included some of the key topics of our time, cultural coding, policing, implicit racism, immigration and diaspora, the role of television, neoliberalism, and this is only skimming the surface. The reader who followed his treatment of this topic soon, uh, these topics soon realized that while Hall eschewed an explicit systematicity in his presentation of this material, there was nonetheless a powerful implicit coherence in his work. The treatment of Thatcherism was therefore inextricably bound up with the analyses he provided of cultural coding, policing, implicit racism, moral panics, this was another phrase that he created, immigration, neoliberalism, and so on. So what was distinctive about his analysis of Thatcherism? Using the Gramscian notion of hegemony as his primary reference point, uh, Paul uh, Hall, in characterizing a politics as an authoritarian populism, um, delineated it uh, through a strategy, uh, the um, formulation of a strategy for mobilizing consent uh, that integrated several fronts. These fronts included primarily racism, both explicit and implicit, the crude but, the crude but effective rhetoric of law and order, the generation of moral panics. These were created to stigmatize social, uh, certain social and cultural groups for her political advantage. Hence she called the miners the enemy within. Uh, there is a phrase, uh, there is a section in the handout where she uh, explicitly compares the miners to the Northern, Ire and, uh, North, Northern Irish IRA uh, freedom movement. Of course, they use tactics that today we call terrorism. Then there was also a repeatedly stoked and media-driven disquiet about crime involving inner city youth, especially mugging, the very designation of which by Murdoch's pro-Thatcher ta tabloids carried open racial uh, uh, um, implications. And an equally contrived alarm over, this is the British term, skiving for shirking uh, welfare recipients and strikers. Hall argued that this populism could not be overcome by a left still attached to a status political horizon, bent on using the instruments of the state to defend uh, interests based on class and class positions. Instead, he suggested, the left had to promote a populism of its own, involving the marshalling of forces along a broad and diverse front, not overwhelmingly dependent on state formations for its success. He was criticized for this proposal, 
on the one hand by those who thought it too nebulously utopian, uh, the argument of this critic, uh, these critics being that any expanded politics of the kind proposed by Hall would require bringing together heterogeneous groups and movements that were unlikely to co cohere into any kind of effective longer term political bloc. On the other hand, he was also criticized by stalwarts of the old left who were dismayed by what they perceived as his demotion or abandonment of class as an analytical category in what was ostensibly a Marxist assessment of Thatcher's UK. But today, uh, five virtually uninterrupted decades of the Thatcherite hegemony, the Labour governments of Blair and Brown having merely embedded her neoliberal policies while giving them a less bellicose uh, front, as Blair's rictus smile replaced Thatcher's hectoring snarl on television screen, th th these five decades have in the main proved all right. The mobilization undertaken by Thatcher exploited shrewdly the complex fractures and on and on passes emerging in the British body politic as the post-war Keynesian compromise buckled under the weight of pressures its economic model could no longer resolve. In their quest for an adequate response to the collapse of the post-war settlement, Thatcher's opponents always seem one step behind her in the wretched but nonetheless crucial competition for the available forms of hegemonic primacy. Thatcher enveloped her economic agenda in a wrapping that contained carefully and always opportunistically several components of British culture that could be ordered in ways that recomposed to her advantage the forms of opposition confronting her. Her opponents, by contrast, seemed always to be in a fatal lag when it came to finding alternative resources for the task of hegemonic recomposition. Many of the key ruptures and transformations associated with the collapse of the Keynesian Compromise were only tenuously connected with class and explicit class positions. Thatcher and her backers realized, for instance, as Reagan and his handlers did in the US, that repeated invocations of patriotism and striving to earn your way, when delivered with the appropriate rhetorical pitch and the requisite symbolism, the fictional Reaganite quote, welfare queen, demonized for picking up her checks in a Cadillac, the Thatcherite equivalent being the mutually, uh, equally mythical uh, chappy, English expression, or fellow on the dole with his Jaguar and small yacht uh, parked in front of his rent-subsidized council house, served to dragoon significant fractions of the working class into voting against their own economic interests. The essence of this class dividing strategy, strategy is reflected in the words of one of Reagan's slogans. Quote, I believe the best social program is a job, end of quote. This, cat, this catchphrase indicating that taking a job with miserable pay that made one a, a veritable serf could somehow obviate the need for a welfare state also represented the quintessence of Thatcherism even as she espoused policies which destroyed the industrial base that was the massive core of working class employment in the UK. Overcoming this Thatcherite hegemony was clearly going to require a counter mobilization on a comparable scale. So far, the surge of support for the Labour Party led by Corbyn seems like the beginning of this counter mobilization. I'm speaking here somewhat hopefully. Hall, as I said, always worked with an extensive and varied theoretical framework. His range of interests were correspondingly broad. Um, I mentioned several of them. He was also the foremost explorer of the phenomenon labeled cult multiculturalism, a label much excoriated in the right-wing press because of its implied dilution or relativizing of a settled and robust English identity, an identity accompanied by largely unacknowledged and sometimes savage mechanisms of uh, stereotyping. These mechanisms um, appealed to the British people uh, primarily by resorting to some version whether mildly attenuated or full-blown, of the retrograde fantasy of a Britain that was once populated by sturdy folk who talked like Miss Marple in the Agatha Christie uh, detective series shown on PBS. Uh, sturdy folk who dressed like Mrs. Thatcher with uh, hats, handbags, pearls, 
and decorous costumes, or her multimillionaire husband, Dennis Thatcher, in his tweed jackets, the petty bourgeois grocer's daughter, Thatcher, was once recorded on, leak, on a leaked tape taking elocution lessons to make herself sound more like TV's Miss Marple, the Miss Marple of this caricature, who cycled decorously da down the cobbled streets of antique villages, coupled with a yeoman working class that would tip its collective cloth cap at Miss Marple as she cycled past these befit befittingly deferential representatives of England's yeomanry. Hall, of course, had no truck with this cockeyed and, 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 and anachronistic sentimentalism, sentimentalism which naturalized and concealed the very mechanisms of uh, bias and stereotyping served by such ro rose-hued invocations of a merry oldie England. In acknowledging correctly, of course, that the UK has always taken many more multifarious, less overt, and often troubled paths when dealing with the questions of national and ethnic identity, Hall quickly decided that there is more than one species of multiculturalism. The one that grabs the headlines, sometimes with its vacuous and politically correct slogans, was typically based on an identity politics propped up by the appropriate discourse of rights and liberal inclusivity. Inclusivity. Hall, however, was, something, uh, was about something much more challenging and hard-headed than the latter identity politics. Namely, the question of how the dominant culture has an inbuilt insularity which can only be contested without guarantees, his favorite phrase, if we manage to find real alternatives to it without resorting to the self-defeating means espoused by single-issue constituencies using their self-identities as the only basis for this struggle against the prevailing order. Hall's writings on this topic were really much more about the partial and selective ways in which all identities are constructed by the dominant order. That is, he wrestled above all with the question of multiculturalism as a problematic rather than simply being interested in championing a boutique multiculturalism where the picture of the fabled Miss Marple is expanded by the insertion of a smiling turbaned Sikh or a beaming dreadlocked Rastafarian. Don't ask me how Thatcher succeeded in getting so many British people to succumb to this laughable fantasy about British identity, but for nearly two decades she did. All the while, of course, power was being massively consolidated in the hands of the state. Thatcher, Hall pointed out, set out to break uh, a previous amalgam of power, concentrated mainly in the hands of the gen gentry-based elite in her own party, but with effects that permeated the length and breadth of the British national consensus. In the name of a new amalgam, call it global capital or what you will. But this new amalgam, for all its populist overtones, was still basically a version of state power. Thatcher, like her pal Reagan, made an awful lot of noise about small government and the need, quote, to reduce the state, when in fact the state was the primary instrument of a Gleichaltung, a buzzword in recent times with regard to Trump and Steve Bannon, though several of us were using it in the 1980s to describe uh, Thatcher's project. She used the centralized state to wipe out entire tiers of local government, to spy on her critics, to declaw trade unions, to dismantle manufacturing industry, to work around the boycott of apartheid, apartheid South Africa, to fight the IRA at a time when many reasonable people, including a handful in her own party, realized that only a negotiated settlement could resolve the Irish troubles, to obstruct German reunification, to enrich her husband Dennis and their prodigal son Mark, to undertake the neocolonial task of repossessing the Malvinas Islands after they had been seized by Argentina, to reduce spending on education, to administer a program of privatizing publicly owned enterprises, to deregulate the financial sector, with the disastrous consequences that became evident in 2008, and so on. The state, duly reinforced by her in areas that abetted her project and weakened in those that did not, was thus central to Thatcher's project. <laughs> 
Her success in generating her authoritarian populist project depended on her ability to mobilize certain resources of desire and fantasy as opposed to interest. This focus on desire and fantasy as opposed to interest has long been analyzed by the Marxist tradition. Decades ago, the Frankfurt School pioneered an analysis of the authoritarian personality that has been in the news after Trump's election. And recently, Slavoj Žižek has furnished accounts of ideology based on the suppression or, of, or overriding of interest by fantasy and desire. If theorizations such as Hall's uh, are somewhat recent, the phenomena associated with the politics of desire and fantasy, overriding considerations derived from interest are not. Hitler's dramatic nighttime rallies are the initial exemplary instance, but Reagan, with his syrupy voice and awe shucks cowboy movie manner, and Thatcher, with the hats, pearls, and handbags swinging Iron Lady snarl, involved in different ways an infusion of the libidinal into the political. To conclude, the biggest difference between Trump and Thatcher has, however, nothing to do with politics per se, or the libidinal dimensions of a politician's persona. I'm referring here to the fairly recent burgeoning of computer-driven technologies, especially the development of instruments to mine and, an and analyze big data. The politicians of Thatcher's generations had to make do with polling information based on standard demographic indicators, age, gender, education, occupation, income level, religion, place of residence, and so on. The emergence of social media and the requisite technological tools to harvest data from the click prints of those on social media, as well as our computer recorded subscriptions, donations, credit card transactions, vacation choices, social networks, leisure pursuits, hotel, airline, and restaurant reservations, and so on, allow these to be translated into detailed psychometric information useful to politicians and their campaigns. There's been much type, uh, hype. Uh, I think Fred uh, uh, Van Leeuwen referred to Trump's use of Cambridge Analytics earlier. Steve Bannon is a director of Cambridge Analytics to provide his team with complex number crunching information of the kind just described. What, whatever the hype, it is difficult to gainsay from the accounts given by informed reporters that Trump's team was able to use Cambridge Analytics to target very precise niches of voters with political pitches tailored specifically for them. You could almost go block by block through a neighborhood and target your pitch using the, this psychometric information. By contrast, Hillary Clinton relied heavily on TV advertising and Trump hardly at all. Television is simply too imprecise in its targeting when compared to techniques derived from the uh, computer-driven psychometrics employed by Trump. Compared to Trump's technological scalpel, what Thatcher had at her disposal was a bludgeon. But however, both, however, found ways to uh, their respective ways of pouring oceans of venomous libidinal energy into a politics at once populist and authoritarian. The less well-off amongst her supporters, I'm talking about Thatcher's supporters, were effectively defrauded by Thatcher, as is starting to happen to those of America's golfer in chief. Whether this fraud is undertaken with a scalpel, in the case of Trump's team, or a bludgeon, a la Thatcher, does not matter in the end. Thank you.